We're in Matthew chapter 24. We got as far as verse 9. Um, but just a little recap. I asked last week why why is prophecy so important? Um, many churches don't want to uh, address prophecy of any kind. You know, They don't want to go to the Old Testament and teach the prophets. They don't want to uh, teach any of the prophecy in the New Testament. They stay away from the book of Revelation. They'll stay away from Matthew chapter 24, um, the last part of 23, all of this. One third of our Bible is prophecy. And I think it's one out of, I don't have my notes with me, but I think it was like one out of every 10 verses in the New Testament has to do with prophecy, either being fulfilled or prophecies that were being spoken then that have not yet been fulfilled. So, um, Two of the biggest things in the Bible that were spoken prophetically, one was the, well, let's, let's throw in three. One, that Messiah would come, which Jesus fulfilled, and he fulfilled so many prophecies that it's probably, almost said the wrong word. Statistically, it's impossible for one man to fulfill all the prophecies that he did. At least 300, depends on what kind of scholar or who, who you talk to. I've heard as many as 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that, that spoke of the first coming of Jesus, up to 600 prophecies in the Old Testament that spoke of his first coming, and that many more, at least as many, about his second coming as his first coming. So it was two, the two advents of, of Jesus, of our Messiah, were spoken of prophetically, fulfilled by him, not in near misform like you might get if you listen to people who talk about Nostradamus' prophecies, but very specific, very detailed prophecies as far as names and places. And, and that doesn't include prophecies spoken of other people like Alexander the Great or like Cyrus spoken of, I think it was 300 years before he was even born. He was named specifically. But you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3. In the garden. And, and here's why I think there's such a great attack on Genesis right now. It's not just about creation versus evolution. Because once you get past chapter 1 and chapter 2, you go straight into the garden with Adam and Eve. And you have the fall of man and you have the, the sin of man. A man who gives in to his desire of his own heart chooses his wife over God and falls, and therefore we all have inherited that very nature of his. But in that garden, in that moment, is the prophecy of the coming of the one who would redeem, the one who would bring salvation. The first prophecy is spoken in the Garden of Eden at the beginning. Now, if they, they can aim at evolution all they want to because what they'll do then is they'll take it and they'll, they'll go chapter one and chapter two can't possibly be true you get to chapter six and you start talking about Noah that can't possibly be true couldn't possibly have happened well, not according to us it can't happen to hear people who know how to explain the gospel say it doesn't fit modern science who cares if it doesn't fit modern science? Miracles don't fit modern science. Period. There are many people in the church who are beginning to talk like the Sadducees. And we've explained who they were. They were the counterpart to the Pharisees in Jesus' time. And the Sadducees didn't believe in anything spiritual. They didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in the miracles. And we have that in the church. And they're very outspoken right now. And they're attacking Genesis. And they're attacking Revelation. And they are putting doubt out. You even have people like Andy Stanley who has the second largest church in North America. Or in, well maybe it is North America, but in the United States. Who brings doubt on Genesis and the creation account. This man has more influence over more people. Many more than his father Charles Stanley has. And he doesn't, he says, he doesn't understand Revelation. So, you know, why? Why go there? All right. 
I, I don't know why you get up on Sunday morning then. To attack the inerrancy of the Bible, to say things like the Bible is not and was not, especially not the Old Testament, the building block of Christianity. I'm sorry. Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy over and over and over again. The, the book he quoted from the most. I think Isaiah is the prophet he quoted from most. I think those are building blocks of our faith. And any man who stands up and rejects that is not speaking on behalf of God. For other very influential pastors to say, we need to stay away from prophecy. We need to not be so focused on prophecy. Is to say, we're not to be focused on a third of our Bible. When you do that, then you can stop calling sin, sin. There's no way to hold anybody accountable. There's no, you have the likes of Rob Bell who say there's no hell, there's no hell coming after this. There is no judgment. Well, that throws out even more. And especially prophetic word that Jesus talked about here. And you have these people again that are saying, well, I only pay attention to the letters in red. I don't listen to Paul. I don't listen to Peter. I don't pay attention to any of that. The problem is Jesus himself, and you can find red letters of Jesus testifying of those two guys and their word in the book of Acts and in a couple other places. So be very wary of anybody who tells you to stay away from prophecy, anybody who is attacking uh, Genesis and Revelation. Be very wary of that. It is false teaching, period. It is leading people astray willfully, period. It is bringing doubt on the word of God and who Jesus is. He wasn't just a good teacher. If he was just a good teacher, we have nothing to look forward to. Because he taught on the resurrection. And if he taught on the resurrection and we, and, and we can believe that, how do we not believe on creation? How do we not believe in Adam? How do we not believe in Moses or in Abraham or Isaac or Jacob? It makes it very easy to pull away from Israel being the focus of anything and making it all the focus of the church. What we are defining as the church. And I used to think, you know, this, this compromise was pretty much mainstream America and that was it. But England already has churches that are completely empty on Sunday morning because they have nothing left. We are going the way of Europe. Europe has cathedrals all over the place that do not have the word of God taught in them if they have anything taught in them. And it's gone beyond America because America sending out so many missionaries has taken a false gospel to other nations and promoted the same thing in other places now. And so you'll find the same attitude. You find that, yeah, you can believe in God and you can believe in your idols. And it's all one big happy family. All roads lead to Jesus. All roads lead to God. And they don't. They don't at all. Jesus is very explicit. Jesus is very um, exclusive. In John 14, when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. It was very, very exclusive. There is one way, him alone. The Bible tells us it is one name under heaven by which men can be saved. Jesus the Christ. I learned something this week. Speaking of that, as I was getting ready to, to teach the youth group on Friday, that in the New Testament, in the Gospels, they only use his name, Jesus. But when you get into Acts, you get past the resurrection and the ascension, he is almost always always and exclusively has his title attached to his name the lord jesus the lord jesus christ jesus christ because he earned that title he earned those titles as messiah and lord and savior 
by his death on the cross, by his resurrection from the dead, paying for our sins, and by his ascension into the throne room of God. The only time past the ascension that you see just Jesus, it's referring back to a time of his life before the cross. So every time they're speaking of him in the present tense, after the ascension, he always has the Lord, he always has Christ. We need to get back to that. That needs to be in the forefront of our mind. That he's not Jesus, the teacher who sat on the Mount of Olives and explained things and opened up the word of God to people or who performed miracles. But he is our Lord and our Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the one that came to save the world. And there is nobody else. No other spiritual leader can make any of these claims of any other religion, of having died, been resurrected from the dead, and going to heaven. Nobody else makes that claim. Nobody else, nobody else can. There is no other religious book in the world of any other religion that makes the prophetic claims and the fulfillment of their prophecies to the detail that the Bible does. And there is no other book, period, in the world that has been so meticulously maintained over the centuries. None. Homer's Iliad comes the closest, and it's by thousands more copies and partial copies that we have of the, of the Word of God over the Iliad. To say that we can't trust this is to just turn a blind eye to the obvious. It is an absolute refusal to trust in God's word and to trust in him. If you don't trust in this, you don't trust in him. I don't care what Andy Stanley tells you. I don't care what Rob Bell says. Or some of the others. I mean, you could go down a whole long list. The only way, though, you guys, you know for sure, and I've been beating on this for weeks now, the only way you know for sure you're not being led astray, you are not being fooled, is to know the Word, to know your Bible. You'll find out the reasons why they don't want you to pay attention to it. You have to know it, or you don't know him. You don't know what he wants. You don't know how, to, how he speaks into your life. There's a reason why, and I haven't really thought about this very deeply, but a reason why the thief on the cross would look at him after having berated him with the other thief. You know, he was put on a cross between two thieves. There's a reason why one eventually was cut to the heart and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your throne. It wasn't just an experience. It wasn't a feeling he had sitting there on the cross. He knew. It had been put into him as a, as a young man. It had been put into him as a kid. And somehow in that last moment, after rejecting it for so long, he can look next to him and recognize his Messiah. In Jesus' words at that last moment. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Three people died that day. That we know of. Two ended up together. In paradise. One ended up in hell. Tormented for all of eternity. You don't like that then reject hell and accept God the point of all of this is not to condemn anybody Jesus said the world is already condemned in John chapter 3 we all know for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life Do we know verse 17? 
that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that through him the world could be saved? And a few verses later is when he says, the world's already condemned. They come to condemn the world. The world's already condemned. The, the guilty plea on the world is already there. The decision's been handed down. Death is brought on by sin. The judgment's been made. The carrying out of the sentence has been delayed. We better understand everybody and if anybody here anybody watching is not saved anybody listening in the future not saved you are only still here you are hearing this by the grace of god you're still experiencing the grace of god whether you're going to accept it or not and understand you can fully experience it by accepting it by giving your heart to him by Asking him to forgive you of your sin, recognizing that you need that. And he says, all who come to me, I won't lose any of them. I won't turn anybody away. And that is the only way. Jesus himself is going to give prophecies here. We started last week with him. He had... Uh, prophesied about the temple that not one stone be left on another we went through that last week and showed how in 70 a.d titus vespasian entered jerusalem after having besieged it after having they, they just wouldn't give up to the point of starvation to the point of cannibalism and when the temple was set on fire by an overzealous um Soldier, they ended up tearing it apart till not one stone was left on another because all the gold melted in the fire and ran down between the stones. And to get their money, to get their pay for what they had done, they had to tear it apart stone by stone and scrape the gold back out. And so Jesus' prophecy there is completely fulfilled in 70 A.D. In verse 3 says, Now as, sat, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him saying, Tell us, when will this thing or these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So when will these things be? Probably referring back to that prophecy of Jesus that the temple would be thrown down. But Jesus doesn't answer their question exact or questions exactly the way they're thinking their mindset is he's getting ready to set up his kingdom now right then that they're getting ready in their mind for a coronation of the messiah and so i don't think they could possibly completely understand the words that he would speak lately are here to answer these questions he says take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying i am the christ and will discuss or will deceive um, many and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. see that you are not troubled for all these things must come uh, to pass but the end is not it's not yet all right so we're going to hear about things leading up to this and we we went over these again last week many will come and deceive you and, and there's always been that since the birth of the church. There have always been those who come in and try to deceive. Even Israel before the birth of the church. There were many prophets who would go to kings and tell them what they wanted to hear. We just went through one on, on a Wednesday night a couple weeks ago. Uh, with Ahab. And, and Jehoshaphat who should have never had an alliance with him to begin with. Has an alliance. He goes to visit. Ahab says hey go, go up to war with me. And and he brings in 400 prophets. And they all tell him, yes, go. The Lord's with you. You Go and do this. But Jehoshaphat re can recognize that none of these speak on behalf of God, of Jehovah. And he says, isn't, isn't there one prophet left in, in Israel? 
that can speak and does speak about Jehos- uh, about Jehovah? And, he, and he, Ahab's return is, yeah, there's one, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head here, but there's one, but he hates me. He only speaks against me. He doesn't have anything good to say. And Jehoshaphat kind of recoils from that. Don't, don't talk about one who speaks on behalf of God like that. And so they bring this guy in. And he tells him, listen, if you go up, you're going to die. And Ahab looks at Joseph and says, you see, I told you. In other words, the desire of Ahab's heart was more important to him than the word from the Lord. The word from the Lord there was not to condemn him or to bring death to him. It was a warning. Don't go. Trust in the Lord. Why, why would you go? Then Ahab dies because of that battle, because he goes anyways. Jehoshaphat also, almost. He has a close call, but he gets away. Jehoshaphat was one of the better kings of Judah. He just had a problem with the guys that he hung around with. We're going to hear of wars. We're going to hear of rumors of war. We see it all the time. We have grown up, most of us, in a time when there either was full-out war or concern about war with other countries in our country. People my age grew up. We were born during the Vietnam War. We grew up during the Cold War. We were always worried about Russia and who was going to push the button first. And it didn't really bring you any peace of mind to know that if they pushed their button, we would push our button and wipe them out too. That really doesn't bring a lot of peace to anybody. And even now we have the ability, both countries have the ability to destroy the entire world. Russia four times over and the United States five times over. That's not, that's not destroy the world if we all fire our missiles at each other. That is one nation can destroy the world four times. One nation could destroy all of humanity five times. One tube in a Trident submarine carries more firepower than all of the ordnance that was set off in World War II combined. In one tube, including the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. One tube in, a, in, a, in one of our submarines has more firepower than all of World War II. That's insane. We grow up in a generation where we can, as the Bible says, destroy ourselves. That God has to shorten these days because if he doesn't, and especially in the tribulation time, if he didn't shorten those days, there would be no flesh left. That's insane. That is the insanity that the world has reached. And just so you know, mankind has never made a weapon that it hasn't used. When they exploded the first atom bomb, they didn't know how far it was going to go. They didn't know all the damage it would do, and they set it off anyways. They didn't know if it would burn up the complete atmosphere. And they still set it off. We have never made a weapon we haven't used. And you get into Ezekiel 38 and 39, there appears to be some kind of nuclear exchange. You'll see the cleanup of that war. There are many wars and rumors of war. And all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and the kingdom against kingdom. There will be famine and pestilence and earthquakes uh, in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. So nation against nation, we have certainly seen that. Kingdom against kingdom, we have seen that. Famines, more people today starve to death than ever in our history. Pestilence, we, we don't even know all of the 
different diseases that are alive on the planet Earth right now. We can't deal with the ones that we do know about. Earthquakes. I just looked up today, this morning, and found a, a, a YouTube channel that does live earthquake updates. And it's th this report that I just glanced at today was put out 20 hours ago. And this is his comment. And this is not a this is not a Christian webpage or, or or site. It doesn't claim to be nothing. They're just tracking all the earthquakes on the globe. And they say we are in a deep earthquake state right now event deep earthquake event right now and I, I didn't have time to listen to how far but the number of 5.0 or better earthquakes is crazy they got dots all over the all over the globe where they're occurring it's amazing the earth is shaking it's trembling all over the place and, you know, I mean, we're not just talking out in Hawaii. We're talking all over the United States, all over South America, especially on the West Coast. New Zealand had over 100 earthquakes last week. And, and so multiply those to the bigger continents and the bigger regions of the world. It's funny to me, kind of, you know... I, I don't think it's too ironic, but maybe some people would just chalk this up to irony. But every time Iran decides to do something against Israel, they end up having an earthquake in Tehran. Kind of amazing, isn't it? Look at the hurricanes that we've had. It was, you know, timely that, that Lexi could be here and, and talk to you about why she was there. The two major earthquakes, and we had a, 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 I'm sorry, a hurricanes, and we had, we had a crazy amount of hurricanes and and ones that hit at, at uh, category five or more, and or, or more category five, um, last last season, and we've already had a hurricane this year. It's not even hurricane season yet. We've already had one come into the Gulf. The earth is groaning for its redemption. Paul described it that way in Romans, I think. And Jesus is saying here, these things are going to happen. And they're just the preview. They're not the main thing. There are, I think, five earthquakes in the book of Revelation that will shake the whole earth. All of these are just the beginning of sorrows. They're just the birth pains. Just the beginning of the birth pains where they increase and then they decrease and they increase and they decrease. And we talked about this last week and I've been in with my wife twice when she delivered and well, I've been in three times when she delivered, but the one was a C-section. The other two, though, were natural birth, and I watched it. They had a monitor that shows. I, I knew before she did sometimes that the contractions were starting, so I knew to get ready. I knew to get ready. I could even tell her, hey, well, here it comes. That's, you know, not what they want to hear. And then you start the whole coaching thing, breathe, 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 shut up. <laughs> okay. All right. You know what? You're the one. You deal with it how you feel fit to deal with it because it's better than me. So I thought she was going to break my hand on one of them. It was, that was the actual birth, though. So anyhow, I love you. Um. But when you watch the monitor, you see these these things begin to run into each other. You know, in the beginning, you see the contraction start and build and then drop off. And then start and build and then drop off. But right before the birth, these contractions begin to run into each other and, and pile onto each other. And you know, it's time. 
we're seeing that now. We're seeing Ezekiel 38 and 39 shaping up before our very eyes. The, the nations coming together that will attack Israel from the north and Russia and Turkey and Iran. In Sudan, who's pledged their allegiance to it. And they are a part of it. In Libya. And they're a part of it. And you see Saudi Arabia objecting, objecting to all of it. And that's their position in that attack in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Other parts of the world saying, you need to leave Israel alone like our, ourselves. Like our president, like our, our UN ambassador. Saying, leave them alone. How can you condemn them for defending themselves against 50 rockets being fired at them? But the rest of the world does and wants to. And that is talked about in Bible prophecy. Verse 9 says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be uh, offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. The 20th century was the, the most recorded martyrs, Christian martyrs, people dying for their faith in Jesus, than all the previous centuries put back together, are put together from the book of Acts. One century, more Christians died than all the other centuries before that since the birth of the church put together. And we are on track to top it now. There, there's estimates anywhere from 10,000, 20,000, all the way up to a million people giving their life for their, losing their life for Christ each year right now. And so there's some discrepancy because of the way they collect data and, and whatever else. But that's, that's the guess. That's the estimate. Because it's not documented. Very few people, very few Christians, martyrs, are documented anymore about how they lose their life because most of it's happening in the streets. China's not going to report how many churches they're burning down or how many people they're going to they're destroying pakistan is at the top of the list one of our middle eastern uh allies supposed allies iraq and iran north korea north korea is a huge persecutor of the church We have people dying in our own country for their faith. In some of these mass killings that we've had in the past 10, 15 years, we know, we don't report on it so much anymore, but we know people were targeted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. It's happening. It's going to happen. So what do we take from that? We take from that. Well, and, and let's just say here, too, we, we can take the church out of this and just say, well, he was talking to the Jews. This is kind of a Jewish mindset in this teaching. Yep. What has happened to Israel in the last two centuries or last 2,000 years? More and more persecution, and it's ramping up again. It's not just that they protest the existence of Israel, but anti-Semitism is on an all-time rise all over the rest of the world right now in spite of the fact that they're helping the rest of the world right now. So if you want to take Jesus' words here, apply them to the church and to, to Israel, and the numbers become astronomical. But it's a warning. This is a warning that this was coming. We shouldn't be surprised. Now, if we look at the church history, what happens every time they're persecuted? They grow. They get stronger. So if the, even if the, the statistic that 
one million give their lives every year. We also have the statistic that 81,000 a day give their hearts to the Lord. And even if you want to back both of those numbers off to more conservative levels, it doesn't matter. The church is still growing. And I'm not talking about compromised churches and including them. I'm not talking about other other cults and religions that call themselves Christian. I'm talking about the, the church that believes that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Is growing under persecution. And it's for the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus alone. So then many will be offended and, and will betray one another and will hate one another. Guys, I think that's something within the church. That, that's not just the world out there when it, when it becomes or when it is illegal to come together. To be an outspoken Christian, when, when we can't speak anymore in the name of Jesus, and they're working on that. It's not just going to be the person across the street who doesn't believe. Even under that kind of persecution, I think you're still going to see the Andy Stanleys and, and some others with big, full churches. Because there'll be state churches. So even communist countries have state churches. They operate under the under the law and the and and the say of the state. Those churches that are compromised now will gladly come under the protection of the state. They don't have a problem with talking about or not talking about redemption or the blood of Jesus. They don't have a problem with not talking about Jesus except as a good teacher. They don't have a problem about staying away from and not naming certain sins that the Bible calls sin. They already don't have a problem with that. They don't have a problem with saying God used evolution rather than creation. They don't have a problem with saying, don't worry about him coming back. He probably isn't anyways. There'll be state-run churches, and they'll gladly concede to that. And they will also gladly turn us over it will happen family members will turn us in it's already happening all over the world if it comes here like it could it'll happen here too I can't tell you how many preachers pastors that are are preaching the word of god that are teaching the word of god are making plans to not be in their buildings anymore. Of hoping that other men, other teachers will come up out of their congregation so that when they have to meet in small group homes and that's it, that there'll be others that rise up out of it that will take that on and will go with it. Even in a small church like ours, how big of a vehicle would they have to bring to round up if somebody walked in and said deny Christ you stand over there refuse to deny Christ you stand over there and everybody who does not deny is going to jail with us how big of a vehicle would it, had to, would it have to be just one cruiser for one person Would it be all of us? Would it be some of us? It's coming. The word of God is offensive to people. In spite of the fact that it's not designed to condemn them, and it's designed to bring salvation. It's designed to, to tell them that God loves them and wants to redeem them. That he already has paid the price of redemption, that all they have to do is believe and, and receive that. And that is offensive to them. It's not just they, they reject it, they don't believe it, 
It is an offense. It's here in America. It is an offense. And it's offense to all kinds of people. It's not just an offense to certain religions. It's offense to anybody. And they'll begin to betray. And we'll hate one another. And guys, we, we can't fall into that. It's one thing to say that we'll be betrayed by somebody else. It's another thing to say we can't begin to hate those who will betray. We still have to love them. We're still called to do that. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. I mean, I'm just keeping it here in the United States. You see the lawlessness that abounds. You, you see how bad it is now. We hear the atrocities that are done to children. It's sickening. This is not just, I'm going to drive as fast as I want to in spite of everybody else. And that happens. That's lawless. But it is. It, it goes all the way to the sickest, most vile crimes you can imagine. And you know what? You can watch documentaries on things that happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. But as you bring it back up to our time, you have to multiply the number of incidences. And even, even if, and I don't think it's possible, but even if you could say, well, by the growth of population, the, the percentage of those crimes has stayed the same, the number of incidents still has to increase for the percentage to stay the same. People are walking into schools and malls and restaurants and shooting without remorse, killing people without remorse. They break in, they steal without remorse. Some even claiming to have a right. You know there's a guy running for office, I think, I want to say it's in Virginia, but I'm not sure now. I can't remember what state he's in. Just saw this yesterday. Flat out, openly claims to be a pedophile. The governor of that, of that, of that uh, state excused or made possible for felons to vote again. So not only can the guy vote, but because he has the right to vote back, now he can run for office. Oh, and, and, and that's not even, I mean, the claim, that's not the only claim he makes. And I'm not going to get into it anymore because it's pretty disgusting. But openly, you just open about it. That... I can do this. I can treat women like this. He thinks women should just be property like a to be used like like a house, like a dog, like it's insanity. And he doesn't care. See, here's the thing. He's probably not going to get elected and he knows it. He just wants to be able to put this stuff out there. That's that's insane to think that it's okay. To think that it's a right. Lawlessness is going to abound and the love of many will grow cold. And there's the challenge to the believer. The lawlessness is going to abound. But we can't grow cold. We can't become loveless because everybody else is lawless. And that'll add to the offense. We can't become loveless because the world is lawless. Now we can go to, I think, 2 Thessalonians. And the Antichrist who is yet to come is called the lawless one. And with the things that I've just described, the insanity that's going on in the world today, when the church is gone and he steps up, because it's 
Paul also writes through the Thessalonian church that he can't be revealed until that which restrains is taken out. So until the Holy Spirit takes the church out, this guy is restrained. That level of evil and wickedness is restrained. When he's taken out, all of this is going to multiply that much more. The lawlessness is going to uh, uh, multiply worldwide that much more. And we can, honestly, look at, look at what goes on around. Listen to a news report for one day. Listen to a, a conservative news feed for one day. And, and take it to heart. And think about it for one day and how disgusting it makes you feel. And we're going, how do we ever get here? Well, because we want to be godless. We want God gone. We want him out of our Pledge of Allegiance. We want him off our money. We want him off our buildings. We want him out of our schools. You want to know how to protect your children in school? Bring God back. Let him back in the door. Get rid of the people in there that promote godlessness, and they do. It's horrific what the, what the curriculums, some of the curriculums that, that they promote. It's hideous. But not being loveless. We can't be loveless. We can't grow cold. But we do have to say something about it. We do have to stand up against what's wrong. We should be speaking out against the things that are wrong. But always attached to it, the possibility of the redemption of those who are doing the wrong. We can't look at somebody and say, you are so far gone, God will have nothing to do with you because you don't know. Now, maybe they have crossed that line because they certainly can. But that's for God to know what that line is. You and I, like Dave said earlier, we've been called to preach the gospel to every creature. And we have been called to make disciples everywhere we go. But he endures to the end, shall be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. When some people think, well, the rapture of the church can't happen until everybody in the entire world has heard the gospel. Then it's preached to all the kingdoms, to the ends of the earth, and then we can go. So let's put up more satellites. Let's get more preachers out there. Let's, let's send out more missionaries. Listen, I don't think that end is the beginning of the tribulation. When we look at Revelation, there will be an angel that God sends through the atmosphere preaching the gospel to everybody who's left. Then the end can come. There'll be 144,000 Jews that will become evangelists. There'll be two witnesses, probably, I believe, Moses and Elijah in Jerusalem, tormenting the entire world for a year and a half, or for uh, three and a half years. They'll be so happy to see him gone. They're going to give presents to each other. They're going to celebrate for three days, and then those two are going to get back up and really freak everybody out. And then they're going to ascend into heaven like Jesus did. And the Antichrist is going to become more wicked and more evil than he was before. He's going to defile the temple in Jerusalem. We didn't get very far today. I could keep on going.
we'll get a little bit farther next week. I'll just say that. But the two, the two things in, in this section that we need to take away from this. Now well, there's more than two, but watch. Pay attention to what's going on. Know the time. Read your Bible. Study the prophecies of the end times. So you know the time. When a brother or sister is having a hard time with loving people, come alongside them. Bear that together. Remind each other, we can't be loveless because everybody else is lawless. We do not want to grow cold. We don't want to be a part of the hate gang. And to the best of our ability, we need to spread the gospel of the kingdom as far as we can. It, it is it is my hope and my prayer that if we stay in in together as a church for another 10 years if he waits that long to call us out if we have that long before they shut us down whatever whatever's going to happen in 10 years in 50 years whatever send as many missionaries that know the word of god with the word of god as far as we possibly can to have more pastors and preachers get up from a younger generation and be willing and, and brave enough to move out into other communities that surround us, other places around the world, around our country, and take the word of God with them and not be afraid. That's what I hope we can do. To learn and to express to one another here when we are together the love of Jesus so that we're encouraged and able to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit when we get outside of this building. To never forget who we belong to. To never forget He's coming for us again because He said He is. And to His words that He speaks to us over and over again, we are not to be troubled. We are not to be afraid. We are not to be dismayed. We know who we belong to, God Almighty. I taught on two names of God in, on Friday to the youth group. Jehovah Shalom, is God is peace, and Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. Don't ever forget that. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that you would be with your church today and especially in places where it is illegal for them to be together. Lord, that you would build them up and make them strong, that they would continue to, to spread and grow. Lord, that they would know what great examples to those of us or they are to those of us who don't have to live in those conditions. That they would be encouraged knowing that they will see you soon. Lord, I pray that we would all be encouraged that, that we will see you soon. Lord, whether it's because we see you in the air, we hear the trumpet blow, we hear our name called, and we meet you in the air, or whether it is by some other way we leave this life and are standing in, in front of you. Lord, that we would look forward to that moment when we see you face to face. Lord, I pray that you would put a desire in, every, in the heart of every person here, every person hearing this, to want to know your word so they know the time that they live in. Lord, fill us with your spirit so our love does not grow cold. in the face of betrayal and persecution, Lord, that we would stand strong in the word 
strong in our faith, strong by the Spirit. And Lord, if there is any hearing this today that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day, the day that they would hear your voice, that they would understand what it means to be redeemed. Lord, they would cry out to you, both the unsaved and prodigals, and receive your forgiveness and walk with you the rest of their days. In Jesus' name, amen.